stepping over the dead to save themselves. Disturbing video of hundreds of African refugees crammed into boats trying to reach Europe. What can be done to deter thousands from attempting this dangerous journey? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. It's a crisis to which many of us have, quite frankly, become desensitized. And when people do talk about the refugee crisis, it's mainly about people fleeing from Syria. But thousands of African migrants and refugees are risking their lives every day to reach Europe. They cross the Mediterranean crammed in tiny rubber and wooden boats that often capsize. They risk suffocation and drowning. Around 10,000 refugees were rescued off the coast of Libya in just two days this week. But more than 3,000 have died this year while attempting to reach Europe, most of them from Nigeria and Eritrea. Italy's Coast Guard and local aid groups have been working around the clock to save refugees. But Italy's foreign minister says Europe needs a long-term solution, particularly one that encourages African countries to keep citizens at home. The European Commission had announced a plan along those lines back in June. We propose to use a mix of positive and negative incentives to reward those third countries willing to cooperate effectively with us and to ensure that there are consequences for those who do not. Well, the positive incentives that he mentions there would be in the form of aid, better trade agreements and easier visa access to the EU. But African countries reluctant to take part could see a drop in EU funding and cooperation. The EU says that it would invest more than $9 billion in the effort over the next five years. That includes money from the EU Trust Fund for Africa, which was created last November, to address the refugee crisis by promoting development on the continent. But opponents say that the Cash for Cooperation plan, similar to the agreement signed with Turkey in March, violates the refugees' rights. Lots to discuss. Let's bring in our guests for today. In Brussels, we're joined by Pierre Vimont, a senior associate at Carnegie Europe. From Geneva, we're joined by Patricia Danzi, the Red Cross's regional director for Africa. And from Maiduguri, Sara Tissiereri, a policy and advocacy advisor for the Norwegian Refugee Council. Welcome to you all. Uh, Pierre Vimont, if we start with you first, is this carrot and stick approach to African nations the best way to prevent people? making this dangerous journey to Europe? Uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, thank you for inviting me, but I'm not so sure. I think <clears throat> one of the problems we're facing with the African countries is that Europeans don't understand what really um, the whole migration process means for these countries. Uh, today, migration is still a main source of uh, support for their economic development through the remittances, the financial funds, all those migrants send back home. Uh, today, these funds still represent three times what the um, public assistance is giving by uh, Western countries or developed countries. So um, if uh, Europeans would like migrants to be pushed back into their con home country, uh, then you have to compensate for the loss of financial resources. If you want uh, African countries to go on with the sustainable economic development, then you have to support them and to help them with that. And I think that as long as the Europeans don't understand the difference of narratives between what they're calling for, which is mostly pushing back illegal migration or simply economic migration because they think today they can't afford it and the African countries which on their sides are very much looking for this migration for financial resources then you're faced with a major difficulty. Uh, Patricia Danti, uh, will the EU's plan actually work? Development aid of course will ultimately eventually we hope improve people's lives but it'll, it'll have very little impact in, in the short term and people will continue uh, to risk their lives and will continue to die. It's a good thing that attention is given to the migrants, to people that flee conflict and violence. And I think it's important to take into consideration that these people are not a threat. They're not a security threat. 
actually they flee security concerns and they flee in big numbers. They flee through countries in conflict and sometimes they're displaced a couple of times. So the, the attention that is given also to African countries and recognition that they have over many, many years taken in so many refugees and so many IDPs is actually a good, a good thing. And we, if you take countries like Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, they have taken in hundreds of thousands of refugees. Chad has 4% of its population that is refugees today. The biggest amount, uh, the biggest number in Europe is Sweden, with 1.5% of the population being refugees. So European countries can also take example in the way African countries have opened their doors, hearts, and communities have taken in IDPs and refugees and learn from, from that too. And refugees take and IDPs take big, big risks. And we see uh, when we, in our hospitals, when we do prison visits, um, migrants being detained for the simple reason that they have crossed a border illegally, sometimes together with people of criminal nature or worse. Uh, when people die in the Mediterranean, but not only in the Mediterranean, we also have the, 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 the Sahara Desert. Many die there. Uh, away from the eyes and the attention of the international community. Um, people go missing, their families are looking for them, and we try to re-establish these family links. It's very, very difficult. Uh, when they are washed up the shores of the Mediterranean, but also in Yemen and Somali coast, uh, volunteers from the Libyan Red Crescent or for the Somali Red Crescent try to identify and bury people in dignity. I think these are just examples of how we should put humanity first when we talk about migration. These are people. They have a story and very often a very, very sad story. Uh, Sarah Tissariere, what will the money be used for when it gets to Africa, if and when? It's a big question, that, it's a, a big if. On fighting poverty and improving people's lives, or is it going to be spent on, on border security, on keeping people in? Um, will it be spent along migration routes or, or in countries that are of strategic interest to, to Europe? That's the question we've been asking for some time from the NGO community uh, with respect to some of the new financing mechanisms we see the EU developing from their side. Uh, you know, the, the rhetoric around the trust fund and some of the other instruments is that this is, you know, development money aimed at addressing uh, some of you know, the serious challenges in, in African countries. Uh, which, of course, is something you know, we very much want to see. However, uh, channels for development cooperation already exist. Uh, there is already money uh, that goes into uh, development in Africa as well as in the rest of the world, and that goes through very clear channels because uh, there's a lot of planning that goes into that. You have to ensure uh, that the government that's received where this money is being spent, you know, has a plan for development and that this money is going to complement that. Uh, otherwise, you risk you know, potentially not being very effective. So there's a real question as to why, when you already have those channels, you need to create some new kind of instruments. What is the purpose? And I think we see the purpose in the title. It's the Emergency Trust Fund for Africa. And the question there is, well, whose emergency are we talking about? Because development is a long-term endeavor. That's not uh, emergency response. So I think the title tells you everything about what the real intention is for this. Because Europe has decided to portray uh, the particular situation they have right now with migrants arriving irregularly as, as an emergency you know, for Europe. Um, so uh, I think that's a big question. How is it going to be spent? We've seen uh, a number of projects already funded. Uh, certainly, there are plenty of sort of classic, uh, let's say, development projects, although, again, it's unclear as to why we need a different framework for such projects, if they're much like the other kinds of development activities that go on already. Okay. Uh, okay. But we also see projects that are deeply questionable, uh, that are using uh, development funds for training and equipment and security services, and that raises a whole host of questions about the nature of that collaboration and what it's going to achieve and whether that's actually to the benefit of the population. Pierre, should we be cynical about the EU's motives here? Who has the most to gain? The EU, of course, is looking to prevent the, the tide of people washing up on its, on its shores. Um, uh, 
do they genuinely believe that, that they're going to that this scheme is going to benefit people who are living in abject poverty who are desperate enough uh, right now to attempt the journey for a better life in Europe no, uh, I think you have to look at the broad picture. I think both sides have a great interest in setting up what was said a few minutes ago about a, a safe, uh, dignified way of uh, bringing some of these people inside Europe. Uh, that's in the interest of the Europeans themselves because, as you know, if you look at the demographic trends in recent years in Europe, we're going to need uh, workers coming out of Africa. There's going to be a need for uh, some of these migrants economic migrants coming into Europe and taking some of the jobs that nobody else is, is ready to um, pick up in, in, in Europe. Even in spite of the high rate of unemployment at the moment, we'll still have a steady flow of um, regular economic migrants moving into Europe. So we have a real interest into that. And on the other side, on the African side, there's definitely an interest in, in helping and supporting a sustainable development in Africa if only because Africa is, uh, is the neighborhood of, um, of uh, Europe and Europe needs to be um, uh, assured that the African continent is going to be secure, stable, uh, going through uh, sustainable economic developments. So both sides have to sit around the table and work this out. And the best way, as it was said previously, is to try to avoid these poor people moving through the Sahel, through the Mediterranean Sea, having so many death, it's um, much better to set up uh, together in an, um, with a mutual agreement a sort of natural, dignified, safe channel so that we can get into Europe economic migrants that are allowed in, that we need, and therefore to be able to build together a sort of agreement that everybody would respect after that. Uh, well, Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel is set to visit uh, three African nations. She'll leave for Mali, Niger and Ethiopia on Sunday as part of her push to increase German aid to African countries. And after she returns, she's expected to meet the presidents of Chad and Nigeria in Berlin. Merkel says that more development aid will give African citizens hope for their own countries. Patricia, um, are European leaders forcing their own migration policies onto to Africa? Is it wrong to link development aid with cooperation on migration? I think aid, aid money has to be looked at always in a continuum. Today you cannot say there is a conflict, we have to do emergency money, we have, there is a stable situation, we can bring in cooperation money, it's development money, it is all linked and very often People flee from protracted conflicts. So one day it's very intense, then a couple of years it's maybe not, but the economy is down. Uh, you have droughts and floods and other um, hazards, and then people also have to flee. So the, the money that is put to the, the to these people and for the countries must be invested responsibly and also in a long-term perspective. It was, it was said it's not an emergency money that will help or prevent people from migrating. It is only if uh, social net is built, schools are built, hospitals are built, access to health care and people feel safe and protected that people can stay where they are. And I think it is also not the right way to tell countries you have to keep people where they are. People are adults, they, they do, they take decisions uh, related to the threats they face and what we try to do to protect them and help them on their way if they have chosen to move through conflict and violence prone countries. Uh, Sarah, um, uh, why are European leaders uh, appearing to uh, be attempting to blend development aid with, with migration policy, it would, it would be surely far better to concentrate on establishing safer and legal migration routes, wouldn't it? Uh, it would. I mean, I think the first thing we have to start from is clarifying that all of the uh, credible evidence shows a correlation between rising development and migration. In other words, as uh, development increases in least developed countries, uh, migration, both immigration and emigration, so in all directions, increases as well. So there's a development, a positive link between, uh, let's say, development and mobility, not a negative link. So the idea that by you know, increasing development, you're going to, to stop migration, 
uh, is not accurate. Um, and, and that's also because, you know, migration is neither a good nor a bad thing in and of itself. It is a reality of human existence and has been for millennia. So it's something to be managed uh, and to be managed effectively so that you, you maximize the benefits and, and minimize the dangers. Uh, but it's not something that you're going to stop and it's not something that you should necessarily try to stop because there's a lot of positives that, that come from it, as has been mentioned. Um, in, in terms of the blending, as, as you put it, uh, yes, I would say um, more than blending, concerned about the conditionality. So uh, a new policy issued in the spring by the EU uh, and endorsed by all of its member states has made very, very clear uh, that the, the EU plans to leverage all of its policies towards gaining cooperation on migration, so therefore on reducing it, uh, from a, its African partner countries um, or all partner countries of, of origin and transit uh, to and to ensure acceptance of return and readmission agreements. Um, so it, it goes far be, it goes beyond blending, arguably, and it really reduces the EU's foreign policy to, to a single objective. Uh, and that really begs the question, where are other objectives left, including the objective of development aid, which is the reduction and uh, eradication of poverty, lifting people out of poverty. And that's in the Lisbon Treaty. It's in the true founding treaty of the European Union. So as an EU citizen and taxpayer, I would like to know uh, how my leaders are going to be ensuring that objective as well, because right now it's not clear. Pierre, do you, do you want to come back on that and, and, and tell us what you think about this, this apparent blending? Is, is there a, a blending of policies here? It's not only about policy. Um, blending uh, about migration and economic uh, development is already there at the source itself, at the root cause itself of migration quite often. You know, we make this distinction, and, and rightly so, between political refugees and economic migrants uh, because um, both are not uh, being um, regulated under the same international conventions. Uh, um, European countries have a duty to uh, welcome and host uh, political refugees according to the Geneva Convention. Economic migration is something different. There we have to um, find the right level or the right um, uh, balance uh, between uh, uh, demand and, and offer in, in, in the economic market. So I think the blending is already there to some extent. The problem is not there in my opinion. The problem is about about listening to what the other side is saying and you have to take this reality into account on one side you have a very practical problems for for many of the European authority in each and every one of their countries is that they don't know exactly what they can do with some of those migrants that have managed safely to get into Europe but who don't have um, uh, who are not, who will be not allowed to come in because they are in an irregular position. Their request cannot be accepted and they have to go back to their country. It's the whole problem about return and readmission. And on this issue, at the moment, most of the African countries are simply refusing to take them back for many reasons because there is a problem of identification and to know exactly from which country do these um, migrants come in. And therefore, you have a, um, a problem there, and, and, and that's where uh, the European authorities are blaming the African countries for. And on the other side, and rightly so, in my opinion, African countries are saying these migrants are quite useful sometimes to help us in our economic development. Some of them are also trying to run away from a, a lot of insecurity that is still there in their country and therefore Europeans are being asked, are being requested to come and help those African countries. The problem is about sitting together around the table and trying to listen to the other's point of view and to try to find some common ground. Yep. This is not easy, I recognize, but just one second. Don't forget that last year, in the middle of this huge crisis with the Syrian refugees, Europe was able to meet with its African counterparts in Valletta, at the Valletta 
summit. By the way, this had been asked for by Chancellor Merkel herself. So that shows that the Europeans are aware that this is a long-term problem yeah. and they really need to cope with this. Uh, Patricia, the European Commission says it's going to put as much as 8 billion euros towards the migration partnership framework over the next five years. It also wants to establish a, an investment fund into which EU states are going to pay as much as 60 billion, or it's hoped that they will contribute that much. It sounds a lot of money. Um, as someone who, who knows about what it takes to, to, to bring aid to, to parts of Africa, is it going to be enough? And, and isn't there a danger that EU states, if they're contributing, will want to say on how the money is spent? To create social fabrics in areas that are far away from capitals is a very, very expensive exercise. And you have today many areas where non-state armed groups are in control. Uh, where the state is not necessarily there to provide services and to bring all this. Also, when a country has signed a peace agreement and peace comes, uh, European countries and other donor countries often turn their heads around and say, OK, now we have a peace agreement. That's fine. Let's look elsewhere because there's so many crises. But we must not forget when a peace agreement is signed, then it's when a country needs most support and when it needs most the support from rich countries to develop areas that are not developed that people see a future that maybe some internal displaced go back and have a hope to start their lives again and i think if as long as political uh, solutions are not fine for crisis and as long as support after a conflict is not given in a sustainable way people will continue to look for safety, security, education for their children, and they will move. Uh, Sarah, Médecins Sans Frontières said earlier this year that it won't uh, accept any more EU money in protest at the Union's, quote, intensifying attempts to push people and their suffering away from European shores. What's wrong with a compassionate and rights-based response, with extending a hand to people fleeing poverty, hunger, uh, substandard living conditions. Why does Europe think the acceptable solution to the problem is to make them stay where they are, uh, to be someone else's problem? And that's a question I would very much like EU leaders to answer, uh, because what we've seen is a progressive securitization, starting from the late 90s, a progressive securitization of migration. And uh, it's led to Europe having a system where uh, border control and, and migration control is, is interdiction-based. And the cost of that in lives lost is uh, 10,000 over the last decade. It's about 2,000 lives a year. That's the base cost of EU border control. And its recent actions uh, in response to, to the to this acute rise, uh, and I say acute because we've had migration for decades, of course, uh, this acute rise um, it, it is to, to undertake further interdiction, uh, interdiction uh, in the Mediterranean in particular. And that's led to even more deaths. So we're at almost 4,000 deaths just this year. That's what EU border control costs. From my perspective, certainly, that is an unacceptable cost. And the European Union uh, and the EU member states need to really revisit that uh, and you know, rethink the way they're managing this and ensure that uh, they're able to manage migration in a way that reduces the risks that people have to take. So that's the regular routes that have been mentioned. You're never going to, you know, very unlikely to completely eliminate irregular migration, but you can reduce it. There's been a demonstrated link between, uh, you know, lack of regular routes and people having to risk irregular ones. Um, and they need to take their responsibilities when it comes to protection. Uh, you know, somewhat of a distinction is being made here between, uh, say, refugees and, and those who who aren't going to qualify for refugee protection. Now, it's really important that uh, Europe um, you know, take its responsibilities when it comes to respecting the Geneva Convention, because the Geneva Convention, which you know, gives, gives refugee rights uh, to uh, people in all the signatory countries, it's, it's only effective if it's respected and if that's worked, if all countries who are signatories work together on that. Otherwise, that system really falls apart. Um, so Europe really needs to uh, put itself back in a leadership position on that and ensure protection. But protection isn't only about uh, people who are going to be found to be refugees according to the criteria. There's a lot of people suffering on their way to Europe. Uh, anyone who's 
moving through Libya yep. is very likely yep. to have several views. They need protection as well. They need services Sarah, as well uh, when they arrive. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're, we're, we're out of time. That, I'm afraid, is where we must end our discussion. Thank you all, Pierre Vimont, uh, Patricia Dancy, and uh, Sarah Tessorieri, uh, for being part of our discussion uh, today. And thank you, as always, for watching. Don't forget you can see the program again at any time just by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion on this issue, join us on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Or you can join the conversation on Twitter at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and all the team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again. Bye for now.